ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار We begin by praising Allah We praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of being worshipped, and that Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, is the slave of Allah, his servant, and his final messenger. The world today has three major, what are usually called monotheistic religions. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Each of these three monotheistic religions, or what are called monotheistic religions, believe in a messenger, or in the case of Christianity, of course, the belief concerning Jesus is that he is more than merely a messenger. Those messengers and prophets, respectively, are Muhammad, May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Isa or Jesus, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. And Moses, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. However, all of these three religions recognize the high quality and noble characteristics of one particular man, one particular prophet whose name is Abraham or Ibrahim in Arabic and for the beginning of this lecture we want to focus on this individual Ibrahim or Abraham because in reality if we focus on him he is the individual, the human being, to whom all those three religions look towards and recognize as, in a sense, the founding father. Let us look to this individual, Abraham. Let us look to his religion. Let us look to his way of life, what he upheld, what he believed, what he practiced. Because in fact, in this man is a clue to understanding something which one may say is revolutionary. The proposition that I want to make tonight and I am going to attempt to prove it, that there is only one God and there is only one true concept and one correct belief in God. And in fact, there is in essence only one religion acceptable to God. That all of the prophets Abraham, Moses, 
Jesus, Muhammad, may God's peace be upon all of them. All of them believed in the one same God. And all of them taught the same religion. So we have to ask ourselves, what was the religion of Abraham? Was Abraham a Jew? Was he a Christian? Was he a Muslim? What was his religion? We do not know from any external evidence or historical document, including the Bible, if we can call it a historical document, the actual name of Abraham's religion. But there are some things that we can understand about Abraham and what he believed and what he preached and what he practiced. The first thing that is clear from studying the life of Abraham and the teachings of Abraham is that he opposed all forms of idolatry. He lived amongst the people who worshipped idols, which they carved from wood and stone. And he vigorously opposed this. And also, the people of his time used to worship the sun and the moon and the stars, and that also he opposed. And he called the people to the worship of the one God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who has ultimate control and power and authority over all things. Abraham's message was clear and it was uncompromising that these things that the people worship from amongst the creation, the created things, the sun, the moon, the stars, the idols carved out of wood and stone, that they were indeed false objects of worship. The people prayed to them, <clears throat> supplicated to them, used them as intercessors between themselves and God. Yet in fact, all of these things were incapable of providing any help or of any benefit that the people's life was wasted and indeed their intellect was destroyed by dedicating themselves to worshipping and seeking help from these things which had no ability to bring harm or to bring benefit. So he was May God's peace be upon him, alayhi salam, Abraham was uncompromising in his monotheistic belief, his call to the people that they should worship only the one true God who is the creator. But there is one particular incident from the life of this great man, Abraham, that highlights and illustrates the reality of the religion that he followed and that he taught and that he believed in and that is indeed the true religion of the one true God. And this story or this event is when Abraham was ordered to sacrifice his son. The biblical tradition tells us that this son was Isaac. <clears throat> the Quran clarifies the fact that this son was not Isaac, it was Ismail or Ishmael. However, at this point, it is not exactly important as to who the son was, 
But what is important in our discussion here is the actual action and the actual events that took place, which are more or less agreed upon. Abraham was ordered by God. The Quran tells us that Abraham had a dream and the dreams of the prophets are revelation. He had a dream or he was ordered by God and God revealed to him that he must sacrifice his son. Now, this is the stage at which we need to stop and think. Here we have a man who has reached old age. Especially in those days and in that time, having a son was something very important. And God had favored him and blessed him with this child. And then God had ordered Abraham, Ibrahim, <clears throat> to sacrifice his son. <clears throat> now we have to think. Where is the logic in that? Where is the reason in that? Where is the rationale in that? <clears throat> Where is the morality in that? Does this sound to you like a good moral action to slaughter a young man? Even if he agrees, as the Qur'an tells us, and we know from the teachings of Islam, that Ismail at that time was a young man of maybe 17 years old. In fact, Abraham approached his son and said, Oh my son, I have had a dream and in this dream Allah has told me to sacrifice you. So what do you think? And Ismail says, do what our Lord has commanded. But how does that make sense? Does that sound moral that you should kill your son? You should kill an innocent human being? But Abraham was a true believer in God. And to be a true believer in God does not only mean that you believe in the existence of God, that there is a creator who controls the universe and has power over all things, who brings it into existence, who is eternal and infinite. This is not what it means to be a believer in God. That is only acknowledging something that is in reality a rational, sensible and inevitable belief for the human being. To believe in the existence of God, to believe in the existence of the Creator is in fact the only rational explanation for the existence of our ordered universe and the world in which we live. But believing in God is more than that. He is ordered to sacrifice his son. So what is his behavior? How does he react to this? His reaction is, we hear and we obey. What God, what the Creator orders us to do, we do it. It does not matter whether it seems to make sense to us or not. It does not matter whether it seems to be moral or not. Because the person who believes, truly believes in God, also knows that the Creator is wise, all wise, all knowing, all seeing, all hearing. And that if God commands something, then God should be obeyed. Because that is what is due to Him. That is how the human being should be before the creator of the heavens and the earth. So Abraham takes his son. <clears throat> and Abraham goes to sacrifice his son. And as Abraham is about to slit the neck of his son, at the point of doing it, an angel comes and intervenes and says, you have fulfilled the command of your Lord. 
God sends a ram which is sacrificed. What this tells us about Abraham is that his relationship to God, his relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth was one of obedience and subservience. That when God commanded Abraham to do something, he submitted himself to God. Although we do not know the religion and the name of the religion of Abraham, we could look and understand by looking at his life that he was someone who worshipped God alone, the one true God, the Creator, and he submitted to the commandments and to the will of God. Therefore, it would be accurate to say that his religion was submission to God. This was his belief. This was his way of life, and this is what he taught to others. How about then Moses? Moses, or as we say in Arabic, Musa, who is mentioned in the Quran, many places in the Quran, the Quran talks a lot about Moses, about Musa and the Bani Israel. Then we know that Moses is descended from Abraham because Abraham had two sons, Ishaq, Isaac, and Ismail or Ishmael. From Isaac or Ishaq, Isaac, one of the sons of Isaac was Yaqub or Jacob. Jacob was the one who became known as Israel. That's what's the name that was given to him also Israel. And as we know, he had 12 sons. From the 12 sons of Israel came the 12 tribes of Israel. And from those 12 tribes came the descendants of Israel, Beni Israel, from whom Moses was one of them. He was one of the Beni Israel. However, what was the name of the religion of Moses? Was he a Jew? If we examine the origins of the term Jew, what are the origins of this name or this word Jew? The word Jew actually comes from Judah from Judah. When the people of Israel were taken into captivity by the Babylonians, there was a small piece of land left which was named known as Judah because this was the land that was inhabited by the tribe of Judah and that was one of the, one of the twelve sons of Israel. So the people living in that land became known as Jews from Judah. But this is something that took place many, many centuries after the time of Moses. The term Jew did not exist in the time of Moses. So there is no way that you could say that Moses was a Jew because the term Jew did not exist. But Moses had a religion which he taught which he believed in, which he practiced, and which some of the people around him followed. So what was the name of that religion? Again, if we go to the Bible, we are at a loss to find the name of this religion. However, if again we follow the same methodology, what did Moses believe? And what did he teach? We find the same fundamental message as Abraham. Moses taught people to believe that there is one God who is unique, eternal, self-sufficient, 
who is the creator and the controller of all things, that there is nothing that can be likened unto God, that God is not like anything in this creation and his representation cannot be made in any way from any created thing. No creature of the sea, no creature of the air, no human being in any way, shape or form resembles God. God is unique. He is the creator of all of these things. And it is to this God, this creator of all things, that the worship should be directed. Prayer, sacrifice, charity, and indeed obedience. Because one of the things we find that is clear from the religion of Moses is that there is a comprehensive set of guidance, of laws, of rules and regulations by which and through which the true believers in God must adhere to and must obey. That salvation and success in this life and the life to come is through believing in God and worshipping Him alone and by submitting oneself to the divinely revealed commandments of God. So therefore we find just as Abraham was someone who worshipped God alone and submitted to the commands of God, then Moses similarly believed in God alone, submitted to the commands of God and taught other people to do the same. This is the religion of Moses. However, today, the religion that is attributed to Moses, which they call Judaism, which of course, in fact, in reality, is not only considered to be the religion of Moses, but the teachings of other prophets as well, seems to tell a different story. Because Judaism, at least Orthodox Judaism, teaches that salvation is from being a Jew. And that in order to be saved, in order to get salvation, in fact, in order to be able to get to paradise, you have to be born of a Jewish woman. In fact, a friend of mine in England had a conversation with the former chief rabbi and he asked him these questions. How can a non-Jew how can a non-Jew go to paradise? And he replied that it is not possible. If you want to go to paradise, the only way that you can get salvation is by being born of a Jewish woman. And that the rest of humanity must go to hell. And this has developed into a religion that teaches that salvation, therefore, is by right of birth. Not due to one's obedience and submission to God. Although they may acknowledge that a Jew, meaning someone who is born of a Jewish woman, who is sinful may be punished for their sins, but eventually they will go to paradise. And that paradise is for them. However, we find in reality, this is not the teachings of Moses. This is something that has been attributed this is an idea that has accumulated over time. That the original teachings and the original pure monotheistic religion of Moses 
that one should worship God alone and submit to Him and that that is the way to salvation has been changed and corrupted into a type of nationalist or a type of racist religion. And then if we look to Jesus, alayhi salam, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. What was the religion of Jesus? If we look to the religion that is today called Christianity, now that is the religion that is attributed to Jesus. We find quite a different story. In fact, it is one of the perplexing things for someone who is searching for truth that when we look in the Bible, we find that whether it is Abraham, Moses, or any other of the prophets that we find, we find a consistent type of message. A consistent message that there is one God who is the creator and the Lord over things, that God has no likeness and no similitude, and that one should submit to his commandments, obey his laws, and that this is the way to salvation. And the people who turn away from that, they will be destroyed. And the people who follow that, they will be successful. But Christianity now tells us that Jesus comes and teaches, in fact, in reality, a completely different message. In fact, a completely contradictory message. It contradicts that message, number one, on the primary basis of what we believe about God. Because in Christianity we are told that the Creator became created. That the one who is the Lord and the controller of the heavens and the earth became a needy, temporary, mortal human being. Of course, that fundamentally contradicts the monotheistic teachings of all of the prophets. In fact, the extraordinary thing is that you can go into the Old Testament and you can find clear statements, for example, in the book of Job, in the book of Job, where Job is describing how God will take a king and this king, he will humiliate him and cause him to suffer at the hands of his enemies and cause him to be killed. And it says in the book of Job, so that they may know that I am God, not man. That I am God, not man. So this passage tells us that God is not a man. And how do we know that? Because this king is punished and humiliated and killed. And you cannot punish and humiliate and kill God because God is eternal, without beginning and without end. He is infinite and God is self-sufficient without any wants and without any needs. Yet Christianity now tells us, in fact, which is the essence of teaching, the teachings of paganism, the very thing which Abraham and Moses and all of the prophets spend so much time and effort and energy trying to call the people away from, Christianity teaches that, in fact, this is what we have to believe after all. That a human being is God. That God manifests himself in the form of a human being. This contradicts what monotheism is all about. In fact, this is the essence of paganism. So this is what is... Christianity now tells us that suddenly Jesus comes along and, what, and, and we are now expected to believe in a completely different message. That God is not only one God, which the Christians don't deny, they say God is one, but they say God is a triune God. That there is the Father who is God, and there is the Son who is God, and there is the Holy Spirit that is God. But they are not three gods, they are one God. Again, this is a doctrine unknown and undescribed by any previous prophets. 
The best that a Christian can do is go to the Old Testament and find some things where they try and make it as if this shows that it's really the Trinity. But where in the Bible does any prophet, including Jesus, sit down and explain in clear and unambiguous terms the theology of the Trinity? It does not exist. It does not exist. And this is not the end of the story. Because salvation, according to Christianity, is not anymore by believing that there is one God who is separate from the creation and different from it. And that God alone should be worshipped. And that salvation is by obeying the laws that God has revealed. Christianity tells us now the opposite or something completely different. That in fact, that you do not worship anymore God alone, that rather you worship Jesus, who is a human being, although of course they say He is God. But worship is directed through Jesus. So now we have an intermediate tree between us and God. And that salvation is not by submitting yourself to God's will and obeying His commandments, no, salvation now, we are told, is by believing that Jesus has died on the cross as an atonement for our sins. And that salvation comes by believing in that and accepting it. However, was that really the teaching of Jesus? Or is this a religion that has been invented after the time of Jesus? Did Jesus preach Christianity? Or did he in fact preach a different religion altogether? First of all, of course, we find that Jesus never preached a religion called Christianity. In fact, the term Christian was only applied as a nickname, rather as the term Jew was a type of nickname. Also, the term Christianity was a nickname. In fact, the Acts of the Apostles state that the first time they were called Christians was in Antioch. A Christian means a devotee or a follower of Christ. Jesus never called anyone to be a Christian. So what was the message of Jesus? Of course we are confronted with a problem. And the first problem is that the, the sources that we have available, or at least the most popular sources, that is the Bible, is of questionable authenticity. In fact, we cannot be sure that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John actually represent the pure and original teachings of Jesus or the pure and original sayings of Jesus. In fact, as is known to biblical scholars but not very widely known to others, that the, even the names of these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the actual names, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, were attributed to these Gospels at a much later stage. The original documents that were circulated were circulated anonymously. They had no names to them. In fact, it was only Eusebius, who was writing about 300 years after Jesus, the time of Jesus, alayhi salam, who said that Arrhenius who was living about 125 years after Jesus, it was Arrhenius who first claimed that Matthew wrote what is supposed to be the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, the Gospel of Mark. But in fact, the original writings were distributed anonymously. We don't actually even know who wrote these Gospels. And this is aside from the fact that there are literally Thousands of other Gospels that are known about. That were rejected as being apocrypha by the church. But which church? 
the church that had chosen a particular doctrine, the doctrine that we now know to, know, know to be the Trinitarian doctrine, the doctrine of vicarious atonement, the idea that Jesus died for the sins of mankind. But much modern biblical research and research into the early origins of Christianity and who was the historical de Jesus clearly indicates and it is a strong body of evidence that Jesus never taught such a doctrine. And in fact, his early disciples never believed such a thing. This is something that was attributed to Jesus at a later stage. In fact, even if we take the Gospels, the what is known as the four Gospels, even if we take them as they are, Realizing that even so they have some doubtful authenticity, but even so we clearly find that Jesus is calling people to believe in God, to worship God, that he clearly distinguishes himself as being someone different from God. He is a servant of God. He is a prophet of God. He is someone who when he needs something, he prays to God. Does God pray to himself? Is God the one who is prayed to or is God the one who prays? Jesus is, says in the Gospels that he has a God. He says, I go unto my God and your God, my father and your father. So he says that he has a God. In fact, you will find, especially in the earliest Gospels like Mark, that Jesus is a very human character. It is only in the later Gospels, as the Gospels proceed in age, meaning they get further away from the time of Jesus, then Jesus is given more and more divine attributes. But in reality, we will find that Jesus is a very human character. For me, one of the most startling evidences of that is in an extraordinary incident that takes place where Jesus is riding on a donkey. Now that's the first thing. Does God ride on a donkey? Jesus is riding on a donkey and he feels hungry. So a God riding on a donkey feeling hungry? A hungry God? And then he sees a fig tree he sees a fig tree, so he wants to eat some figs. So he goes to the fig tree and he discovers that there are no figs on the tree because it wasn't the season for figs. So this God does not even know the season of figs. He's supposed to have created the heavens and the earth, but he doesn't even know there's not figs on the tree. Because he doesn't even know that it's not the season for figs. This is how Jesus is described as being ignorant of these things. How can we therefore ascribe divinity to such a person who is riding on a donkey, feeling hungry and does not even know that it is not the season for figs? In fact, if you look at the Gospels, and you did not go to them with any preconceived ideas. There is no way that you will be able to believe in the divinity of Jesus. The impression that you would get is as Jesus of a man and a teacher who is calling people to worship God and to submit themselves to his divinely revealed commandments. In fact, in the words that are attributed to Jesus in the Gospels, he said, I have not come to change the law. And whoever changes one dot, one iota of the law, will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus himself clearly is a man who calls people to worship God alone, who is calling people away from hypocrisy, who is calling people away from following man-made laws and calling them back to the worship of God and submitting to his divine will. And then if we look to Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. 
Of course, Muhammad traces his ancestry also to Abraham. But not through Isaac, but through Ismail, Ishmael, who was the other son of Abraham. From whom the Arabs are descended. The Arabs are descended from Ismail. In fact, they are called Ishmaelites. And the Prophet Muhammad, may God's blessing be some blessings be upon him, just traced his ancestry back to Ismail. So what was the message of Muhammad? What is the fundamental essential teachings of Islam? Of course, if you were someone who reads the newspapers and watches the TV, you might imagine that Muslims worship some god with daggers and uh, maybe a Klashmikov, and that they believe in blowing people up and killing them and massacring as many people as possible. And that you might imagine that this was the religion of Islam. In fact, you might say that Islam and terrorism are two words that are totally synonymous with one another. However, what is the actual basic fundamental teachings of the religion that was preached by Muhammad? May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Now, unlike Abraham, and unlike Moses, and unlike Jesus, we actually know the name of the religion that was taught by Prophet Muhammad. Because the Quran clearly tells us that the name of this religion, it is called Islam. It's funny, however, that some Christians and some secularists, they say that we are Mohammedans and we follow Mohammedanism. You see, because they say Christianity and Judaism, so they think we're the same, so they call it Mohammedanism. Even though clearly our religion has a name that is mentioned in the book. The name of the religion is Islam. And the followers are called Muslim. And what are the fundamental teachings of Islam? What are the things, the fundamental teachings that a Muslim must believe? Again, if we look, we will find that we are taught to believe that there is one God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the controller of all things, who has power over all things, that He is the sovereign and He is the Lord and that He alone is worthy of being worshipped. That we should not worship the moon or the stars or any of the created things. We should not worship other human beings. That we should direct our worship only to God. And that we should submit ourselves to the divinely revealed commandments, to the laws, to the way that God has revealed for the benefit of all of mankind. So therefore, just as Abraham, and just as Moses, and just as Jesus, Muhammad also taught to believe in one God and submit to Him. If we examine the meaning of the word Islam, then something very interesting takes place. Because the word Islam does not mean, by the way, as you will find George Bush and Tony Blair that want to teach us about our religion now. It's very kind of them. <laughs> Mufti Bush and Mufti Blair. <laughs> Sheikh Al Islam, George Bush. They sh instead of putting president, maybe they can put Sheikh Al Islam now. They say that. He says, Islam, they say, means peace. Islam, they say, means peace. It's nice. Thanks, George. <laughs> and, and, you know, they will get their usual, you know, 
Muslim scholars, you know, to come and also tell us that Islam means peace. But in fact, Islam, and even they will say it comes from the word salama, which means peace, but this is not true at all. As anyone who knows the Arabic language and they know the roots of the words, then it is not from salama. Islam is, does not mean peace. Islam is from, it, it is derived from the word istislam. Istislam which means to submit or to surrender. Islam means actually submission to God. The word Islam means submission to God. Well, it means submission, but in reality, submission to what? Submission to God. You see, the word Islam, the word Islam, the name of the religion describes the religion. If you want to know what is your religion about, my religion is Islam, meaning submission to God. The, and a Muslim is someone who submits themselves to the will of God. And when you read the Quran, you come across something that is both startling and that is beautiful and that brings a sense of relief and peace and tranquility to your heart. Because the Quran is telling mankind, humanity, that all of the prophets taught the same religion. The message of Abraham, the message of Moses, the message of Jesus, the message of Muhammad was in fact one message. They all worshipped the same God. They all called people to worship and believe in the same God. And in fact, they called people to essentially the same religion, the same way of life, the same means of attaining salvation. And that was to believe in God, to worship Him alone, and to submit to His divinely revealed commandments. If you translate that into Arabic, you have the word Islam. So therefore, Abraham himself was a Muslim who taught Islam. And Moses was a Muslim who taught Islam. And Jesus was a Muslim who taught Islam and Muhammad was a Muslim who taught Islam and the true followers of all of these religions were Muslims who followed Islam one God one religion they all taught to worship God alone and to submit to him and that is what they did themselves or tried to do themselves so that God did not reveal different religions and thus cause confusion and conflict. In fact, the Creator has only in reality revealed in essence one religion. One means of salvation. But in reality what has happened is that the people have changed and corrupted and distorted that message. The original message and the original teaching of the prophets was one. They were all brothers one to another in the sense that their religion was the same religion. They worshipped the same God and received revelation from the same God. It was the same, the same angel Gabriel who brought the Torah to Moses, who brought the Injil or the Gospel to Jesus, and who brought the Qur'an to Muhammad. But it is the people who due to their pride, their greed, their hatred one for another, their love of the world, and their following of their desires, and they're speaking about God without knowledge. These are the things that cause them to go astray, to corrupt the message, 
to corrupt the teachings of the messengers and to invent for themselves their own religions. Although they ascribe them to God and they ascribe them to the prophets of God, in reality, the prophets were free from those things. So therefore, there is no reason in reality for the conflict that we find amongst religions in the world today. At least if people from the so-called monotheistic religions were only to be sincere and to sincerely and honestly examine the teachings of their prophets, to take away the traditions and the cultures and the man-made interpretations and they were going, if they were only to go to the root to the essence of what the messengers taught <clears throat> they will find indeed that the God is one the message is one the religion is one and this is why the Prophet Muhammad may God's peace and blessings be upon him he said the religion of God is like a beautiful building. The religion of God is like a beautiful building. And the people go round this building, but there is one brick that is missing. So the people say, oh, what a beautiful building, building but if only this brick was in place. The Prophet ﷺ said, I am that brick. I am the one who has completed that religion and the religion has been perfected through me. And just as if someone who believes or who believed in Abraham and came to hear about Moses could only be a true believer if he believed in Moses. Because how could you believe in one of God's messengers and reject another? It is the same as rejecting God. It is the same as rejecting God. <clears throat> you cannot pick and choose and say, well, I like this messenger and not that one. No, you must believe in all. So if one was a follower of Abraham and Moses came along, one is obliged to follow Moses. And for those people who claim to follow Moses, then when Isa salam came and he was indeed the Messiah, for the Bani Israel, he was the expected Messiah. Then it is obligatory upon them that they must believe in him and not reject him. Because to reject God's chosen messenger is ingratitude and indeed infidelity, disbelief in God. Similarly, every true believer in Isa, in Jesus, Every true believer in Moses, every true believer in Abraham must also believe in God's final messenger, Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. If they are true to their claim that they love God, and they are true to their claim that they believe in God, and that they are true to their claim that they want his pleasure, and that they want to be saved from his wrath, then how can they reject the messenger that he has sent down for the benefit and for the guidance of all of mankind. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah the Creator to guide ourselves and yourselves closer to the truth. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Okay brothers and sisters, I haven't had time to go through all the questions but mashallah lots of good questions so Inshallah <clears throat> Okay First question Was Muhammad able to transcend his religion his belief as Christ ultimately did by loving all equally as one loves God 
Um, I think this is an uh, example of a belief that is not substantiated by any evidence or any fact. And this is the problem that we have. People have beliefs, but they are not substantiated by any evidence. To claim that Jesus transcended his religion and his belief and ultimately he loved everybody is a statement about Jesus without any proof. In fact, from the evidence, we can see that Jesus did not love everybody at all. In fact, Jesus was extremely angry and he pronounced curses and promised destruction for those people who disobeyed and rebelled against God. In fact, as we already mentioned, the story of the fig tree as we already mentioned the story of the fig tree which we didn't finish because when Jesus according to that story found that there were no figs on the tree he cursed it and it withered and died and that is a fig tree that did nothing except be the way God created it what did the fig tree do wrong so we find Jesus also cursing the scribes and the Pharisees he called them and he said to them that their father was the father of lies, the devil, amongst the things that he said to them, and so on and so forth. So this claim that Jesus loves you and Jesus loves everybody and this and that, you know, it sounds very nice, but like I said, it's got no uh, basis in reality. The fact is that all the prophets of God, as Allah himself, loves those people who obey him, who follow his commands and who worship him alone. And Allah is angry with and will punish those people who disobey Him and worship other than Him. This is the reality of the situation. How do the teachings of Buddha fit into Islam? Okay. Uh, the teachings of Buddha do not really fit into Islam at all. Um, really here we are talking today about uh, the well-known monotheistic religions. Of course you will find in all the teachings, in the teachings of all religions, some common link. You will find that all of them call people to do some good things and to abstain from some bad things and many of these good things are universally acknowledged as being good and those bad things are universally acknowledged as being bad however and this is the question what distinguishes truth from falsehood what distinguishes the true religion from false religion how do we know what is true and what is false when it comes to God and how to worship Him? And this is the question that people consistently fail to ask. And they consistently fail to respond to this question. Often because we believe or we have been taught to believe in this society that religion is a matter of faith. Faith means by definition, or so they say, that you believe something unbelievable without proof. I have faith, I have belief, I don't need proof. Whereas this is not how Islam views faith at all. Faith in Islam is that you are believing something very believable upon proof and evidence. Anyway, the teachings of Buddha, as we, of what we know about them today, has some nice things and some interesting things, as I followed Buddhism for several years. But the problem I found with Buddhism is the same problem that I, I encountered about many religions, is that at the end of the day, how could I achieve certainty that I was following the truth? How could I achieve certainty? Yes, the Eightfold Enlightened Path of Buddha, it seemed very nice. 
you know, good thinking, good speech, good action, and so on and so forth. But the problem was, what is good? Who defines what is good? And at the end of the day, this is only the opinion of a man, Buddha. Maybe some things he said are right, maybe some things he said are wrong. Where is the certainty in that? How can you be sure that you are following the truth? And this is the same problem with Judaism and Christianity. Because we have a book, the Bible, that is so riddled with contradictions and discrepancies, that has no real means of historically verifying its authenticity, then how can we be sure that what it teaches us is true and that it is really from God? How do we know which is from God and what has been introduced by men? How do we know that things have not been left out? How do we achieve a degree of certainty? This is something that I found the solution to in Islam, alhamdulillah. In Islam, I found the certainty. I found that there was proof, that there was evidence that it is from God, that it is from Allah, that Muhammad was the messenger. Of course, that is itself a very big subject. So I would like to refer to you to the lecture that I gave in Sydney on this issue. Uh, and that a lecture I've given previously here in Australia, the proof that Islam is the truth or the miracles of the Quran. And anyway, inshallah, those lectures will be available on tape, inshallah. So rather than repeating it here, maybe you could get hold of that, inshallah. Okay, someone has asked me to mention the passage in the Gospel of Mark where a scribe asks Jesus, what is the most important commandment of all? And Jesus replies that the greatest of all the commandments is that you should worship the Lord your God and you should love the Lord your God and love Him with all your heart and all your soul. So, there you go. That's inshallah. He wanted me uh, to mention that. And this is in fact what Jesus says. He doesn't call people to worship Him. He calls people to worship God. In fact, there is a passage that is better than that. And that is the passage of the rich young man. There is a rich young man who comes to Jesus. He says, Oh Master, how shall I gain eternal life? He says that you should worship the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and that you should follow the commandments. That's what he says. Jesus says, follow the commandments. And this is a devastating proof against the Christian belief. Because if Jesus had come to die for the sins of humanity and that by believing he was God and that he had died for the sins of mankind was the means of salvation, then this is the perfect opportunity for Jesus to say to the rich young man when he says, oh master, how shall I gain eternal life? Then Jesus should have said, believe that I am God and that I have come to die for your sins. He could have said that, explained it right out right there, but he doesn't say that. He says, follow the commandments. Follow the commandments. And the young man says, yes, I've done that since I was young. He said, well, there's one more thing that you have to do, and that is give up what you have, give up your wealth and come and follow me. And this is also that every prophet is to be followed. That the people must follow the prophet who is with them. So this is the message of Jesus, that you should worship God, obey his commandments, and that you should also follow uh, the true teachings of Jesus. But this is the problem. What is the true teachings of Jesus? Okay. Mm. What would, this is a good question. What would you say if someone said, Islam is plagiarized from Christianity, and Christianity is plagiarized from Judaism? Well, obviously Islam is not plagiarized from Christianity because then the Qur'an would teach us to believe that God is a trinity and that Jesus is God and the Son of God and that we should worship Him and believe that He died on the cross for our sins. Whereas Islam refutes all of that. The Qur'an refutes all of that. The Qur'an refutes the concept that Jesus is God with, subhanAllah, the most beautiful and logical arguments. Amongst the arguments the Quran brings forth is that, and it asks this question, if Allah, if God was to destroy Jesus and Mary 
and everything in the heavens and the earth, then who could prevent him? Meaning, Jesus and Mary and everything is under the control of God. So how can that, be thing, how can that thing be God? Similarly, the Qur'an mentions concerning Jesus and, and Mary that they ate food and they walked on the earth. See how we make our signs clear for them. See how they are turned away from the truth. So how can something that eats food and that walks and breathes and talks and goes to the marketplace, how can this thing be God? This is someone or something that depends upon God. Nor is Jesus the Son of God. And no human being is the Son of God because God does not beget nor is He begotten. He does not beget nor is He begotten. God is not born nor does, God, nor does God give birth. There is nothing like unto God. So this concept of Jesus being the Son of God or of any human being the Son of God is alien to Islam because the human beings are the creatures. They are the creation of God not his children and not his offspring, because God is far removed from such things. So from that point of view, it is impossible that to claim that the Qur'an is plagiarized from Christianity. Of course, and to say that Christianity is plagiarized from Judaism, then this is, whoever says that is, I don't know, really, um, it's been very confusing to say that. Because uh, there's no indication of that at all. But some people do claim that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they try to claim that Muhammad copied the Bible. That he took his information from the Bible. There's a few problems on that. First of all, there was no Bible in the Arabic language at the time. It didn't exist. The second problem is that many of the stories or the narrations about Moses, about Abraham, about Jesus, about the prophets that are contained in the Qur'an are not the same as those that are found in the Bible. They have some details that are omitted and some details that are not mentioned in the Bible and some of the details are different. In fact, one of the amazing things about the Qur'an is there are places where the Bible clearly has historical mistakes and things that are stated in the Bible that are in contradiction to proven, what we could call proven knowledge or proven scientific knowledge, things that we have discovered today. The Bible has statements that contradict that. The best thing I can think of is the page one of the Bible. On page one, if you open up page one of the Bible, it tells us that in the beginning, God created the light and he called it day and he created the darkness and he called it night and the first day came and the first night came and it's not until the fourth day according to the Bible that God creates the sun. So how do you have night and day without a sun? It says that God created the light, he called it day, he created the darkness, he called it night. But the sun does not exist until the fourth day. Now this is a a contradiction with what we know to be the truth and the reality of how the universe is. In ancient times, that may reflect an ancient Babylonian creation myth, but it is not the facts. It seems to suggest that the text has been changed and manipulated with in order to make it fit to certain ideas that were prevalent at the time. Certainly, the Bible reflects those ideas and they are not accurate. So why don't we find that same sort of mistake in the Qur'an? Why don't we find the same error in the Qur'an? But when we look to the Qur'an, we find something quite different. We find the Qur'an describing the common origin of the universe, how the heavens and the earth were one piece, united, then they were rent asunder, how every living thing was created from water. We find how the Qur'an describes the alternation of the night and the day. And we find many amazing statements in the Qur'an that uh, people have only begun to discover today. So uh, it will be impossible therefore to imagine that the Qur'an or Muhammad وسلم, copied things from the Bible. And again there is no evidence that the Prophet Muhammad had access to that information from either priests or rabbis or from a text 
or a textual source as we know also the Prophet Muhammad could not read and could not write so from where exactly did he get this information one needs to explain that it would seem most likely and the soundest explanation is that this knowledge was from exactly where he claimed it to be from Allah from God Okay, in today's paper, The Herald Sun, it was mentioned that a statue in Italy started weeping blood. Thousands of faithfuls flooded to the scene of this alleged miracle. What do you make of it? I'll tell you a story. When I used to give lectures in Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka, by the way, is about 90% Buddhist. 90% Buddhist. And if you go to Sri Lanka, everywhere you will see statues and statues of Buddha, everywhere. And I met there one uh, lady, alhamdulillah, who had converted from Buddhism to Islam. So when she started telling about how and why she converted from Islam, she said that when I was a little child, they used to take us to pray to the statue and sometimes these statues would perform miracles. For example, they would start crying or water would start coming out from the fingers of the statue. So she said, one day when I was a little girl, I wandered, let go of my mom's hand, I wandered round the back of the statue and I saw that there was a pump and I heard this noise and I could see that there were pipes going from the back of the statue. And and my mother said, come here, come here, come back here. And as they're all thinking, oh, it's a great miracle. But they all know it's not a miracle. They all know the whole thing's a trick. But they let themselves be fooled, you know. They want to really have something to believe. So there are many explanations for such a thing. Uh, the most simple explanation that it is merely trickery. That's all it is. It's just trickery. The other thing is that it could be the shayateen and the jinn that are doing this in order to make... Uh, people believe. I think one of the funniest things I remember, and this happened also when I was in Sri Lanka, when Ganesh, you know the Ganesh, the idol, the Hindu idol of the half elephant, half man, the elephant god. Do you know the story how Ganesh came to be half an elephant, half man? Do you know? Fantastic story. I have to tell it to you. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay. The story is that Shiva. Shiva is with Parvati, right? Parvati is the wife of Shiva, and Shiva is he's one, he's one of the big gods, right? Now Shiva, for the first time, he's got married. And he's really enjoying marriage. In fact, he is making love to Parvati for 1,000 years. Yes. In fact, they have temples in, in India full of Shiva and Parvati, and all the different positions that they tried out and everything is this is their temples so for yes this is the truth so Shiva and Parvati are enjoying themselves for 1000 years and what is happening is that the gods are getting very annoyed because there is one devil that is causing a lot of mischief and the only one who can stop this devil is Shiva so they send someone to go and uh, go and tell Shiva and this one is his son. I don't know how he had the son before he got married, but anyway. So his son comes knocking on the door and Shiva is so angry at being disturbed, he gets his sword and he chops off the head of his son, not realizing it's his son. Okay? <laughs> so when Shiva realizes that, oh, oh my God, he probably didn't say oh my God because he's supposed to be God, right? But he, he chopped... <laughs> He chopped off the head of his son, so he realizes, oh dear, that's my son. So what he did is the next creature that walked by was an elephant. So he chopped off the head of the elephant and he stuck it on his head of his son. I don't know why he didn't pick up his son's head and just stick it back on. But anyway... That is how Ganesh got his elephant head, okay? 
So there was a time several years ago when Ganesh started drinking milk. Do you remember that? The idols, they all started drinking milk. And the Hindus were going and they were giving this idol the milk to drink and everywhere all over the world, Ganesh started drinking milk. I remember some brother said to me, isn't it amazing? Half of India is starving to death and they don't have enough to eat. Yeah, but they are giving the God milk to drink. So the God is drinking the milk, but he can't even give them enough milk for them to all drink. So, you know, these things really, we have to say that if they happen really at all, then they are just from the deceptions of Sha'ir. It could be pure trickery. It could be pure trickery, but it's just from the deceptions of Shaitan. Because we know the jinn and the shayateen can do things in order to fool people. But anyone with any intellect will realize that it doesn't matter if the statue cries or breaks wind or whatever, you know, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean the thing is worthy of being worshipped or that you should pray to it or seek intercession through it. Okay? Because that is something we can understand. It is not, subhanAllah, correct. It does not, has any sense to it, you know. So that's what I make of the crying uh, statues. Okay, Brother Green, Jazakallah khair. You didn't tackle the Christian concept of the dual nature of Jesus Christ. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Um, why do the Jews believe that they alone are God's children? Hmm. Well, uh, I don't know exactly why they believe it. But anyway, if we look historically, certainly the Bani Israel, the children of Israel, upon the face of the earth were the only people. They were the only people as a people who were worshipping God alone and who had uh, chosen to make it their way of life and their uh, way of living that they should submit themselves to the commandments of God. So maybe from that situation and from that environment and from that culture uh, came uh, this belief that they were the selectively and the only chosen people. Of course they were chosen, they were favored. There is no doubt that they were favored uh, above all of humanity. And that God had sent to them prophets. In every age they had a prophet. There was no time when they did not have a prophet with them. So they were favored above all the nations of the earth with that. But from this developed a false doctrine. We could ask the same thing. How is it that Muslims or people who call themselves Muslims seem to think that they don't have to pray, they don't fast, they can do whatever they like, behave in any way they like, commit sins and most atrocious sins, yet they think because they're from Lebanon or because they're from uh, Saudi Arabia or from Bangladesh and uh, because my father, he prayed five times a day. Yeah? So therefore they think that they're going to be saved. You know, we're Muslim. That's it. It's enough. How did that come about? Uh, if we have it, if the Muslims have it, it's very easy then to understand how people from before us had it also. This mentality. Okay. As, for, as far as explaining the concept of Jesus being the Son of God, is there not proof of it in the Bible? You yourself quoted the verse where Jesus said, My father and your father. There are two simple ways to answer this question. One, I have already answered. And that is that the Bible is not proof. The Bible is not proof. I said very clearly, and I mentioned this in my lecture, that there are severe problems with the authenticity of the biblical text. There are problems with its authenticity. We cannot reach any real degree of certainty that the book that we have today, which is called the Bible, in fact represents the revelation that was given to Jesus or the revelation that was given to Moses. There is no real means of achieving certainty about that. Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, there are four Gospels chosen out of, as I already said actually, out of thousands of other Gospels. And they were chosen on the basis of their favoring a particular doctrinal interpretation of what came to be the Roman Catholic Church. There were many other 
Christian sects and groups who believed many different things about Jesus. Many different things about Jesus. We have to understand that what is Christianity today is only that which happened to be the one that dominated. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was the one that was true. So that's the first answer. The first answer to that is that the Bible is not a proof. The Bible is not a proof. Um, so if the Bible says Jesus is the Son of God, it doesn't prove anything. The second argument, uh, the second argument to that is even if we were to accept the Bible as a type of proof, then even the use of the term Son of God is not exclusive to Jesus. There are many other places in the Bible where other individuals are referred to as sons of God. In fact, this use, son of this and daughter of that, is something that is now proven to be a common type of usage in ancient Aramaic and ancient Hebrew. For example, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they came across one of the scrolls that mentioned the sons of light and the sons of darkness. So this term, son of God, sons of light, sons of darkness, Jesus refers to the Pharisees, according to the Gospels, as your father is the devil, the father of lies. He refers to them as the children of the devil. Yeah. So when we find this term being used, then we can say even from internal evidence in the Bible, it does not signify that the human being is divine. It is not supposed to have any literal meaning. In the same way, for example, in Arabic, we call someone Abu, normally we'll say Abu Abdullah, Abu Hamza, Abu Muhammad, Um Muhammad, Um Kulthum, like that. Meaning, this person is the mother of that person, that child. But sometimes, the kunya can have uh, uh, another meaning or it can be attached to an object. For example, the famous one we all know is Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira means father of the, the kitten, right? Because Huraira is a cat or the kitten. Because why Abu Huraira? He loved the cats. He loved cats. So they nicknamed him Abu Huraira. Does that mean that they thought, astaghfirullah, that he gave birth to a cat? He fathered the cat, that he was the father of a cat. Huh? Here, my little daughter, come here. You see, you know. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't have that meaning. It doesn't have any literal meaning at all. In fact, this is something that we have to say. If we think about it, what does it mean to say son of God? If you say it, what do you mean son of God? Do you mean that Jesus was literally the son of God? Because if you're saying... Jesus is God because he's the son of God. And that is what some early Christian theologians, they said. Because their claim was, look, the Bible says Jesus is the son of God. So they said, look, my son is a human being like me. So therefore, God's son must be God, like God. But we want to ask, what do you mean son of God? How, what do you mean exactly by that? You see, your son is a product of an intimate act that took place between you and your wife. Yes? So did God commit an intimate act with a woman in order to give birth to a son? Because that's what a son is. The son is a product of the act, the sexual act. In fact, this is why Allah, He, he says in the Quran, that you say that if you say Allah has a son, then who is Allah's wife? Who is Allah's wife? If you're claiming Allah has a son, then you must say that Allah, he got married because Allah would not say, do not fornicate and then fornicate. So who is Allah's wife? But this is something you cannot say about Allah that he has a wife because God is above such things. God does not get married and have a wife. Even if you say to the children, are you saying God had sex? No, 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 we don't mean that. So what do you mean, son of God? Because that destroys your argument straight away. So he's not literally the son of God. Did God didn't have a literal son. Because to say that you must say God participated in an intimate act. Do you mean he loved him like a son? If for example I give you an example. 
If, for example, I brought with me today my little dog, little Chihuahua, right? Sits here. This is Freddy here. Okay, everybody, he's my son. He's my son. You say it's a dog, Abdurrahim. What do you mean it's yours? No, he's my son. He eats with me at the dinner table. He has a room in the house. The adoption papers are coming through next week. I mean, you laugh. I mean, in England, you know how they love their dogs in England, right? But at the end of the day, it doesn't mean anything. Because why? This is a dog and you are a person. You can only have as your son something that is like you. What meaning does it have to say the dog is my son? Or how about something even a worm? Yes, or a cockroach. It's a, it doesn't have any meaning. So therefore, when you say God has a son, we are more like dogs than we are like God. We are more like cockroaches than we are like God. We really human beings, subhanAllah, you think that now with science we have an insight into really what human being, the human being is. In fact, if you ever have the chance, I'm sure you have gone in an airplane and you fly in the sky and you go high up and you look down on the earth, the human beings become, you can't even see them. They're so small, maybe you can just about see the houses and the cars. So the, uh, the human being, we are small little specks on the earth. The earth itself, if you go far away from the earth, then the earth itself will be a small speck. And in fact, if you go outside our solar system, then our whole solar system will be like a speck. In fact, if you go to another galaxy, our whole galaxy, which is millions and millions and millions of light years across, the whole galaxy would be like a speck. And then, if you were to compare this universe to the throne of Allah, then the Prophet said it's like a ring thrown in the desert. The whole universe is like a ring thrown in the desert. So, God's son was a speck on a speck on a speck. In fact, God himself became a speck on a speck on a speck. What are they saying about God? Really, this is no wonder, Allah, He says, the heavens are ready to rent asunder and the mountains are ready to crumble into ruin because they say that Ar-Rahman has a son. They say the merciful God has a son. No wonder the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah said, the son of Adam has insulted me. He has insulted me and he did not have the right to do that. His insulting me was saying that I had a son. It is insulting God. Because God is far above such things. So, as we mentioned, that even within the context of the Bible, there are many other so-called sons of God, which has no literal meaning in the ancient Semitic languages at all. It does not mean in any way that someone is literally the son of God. Any more that Abu Huraira means he literally was the father of a cat. So even if we use the Bible as a proof, we find the internal evidence does not support the concept of Jesus being God because he's the son of God or having any other meaning except that as it meant in those days if the, indeed they use that term that one is the part of the uh, you know is associated with that thing if you're the son of that thing you're associated with it the son of the devil is someone associated with the devil even though the devil didn't give birth to them they're associated with it so the sons of God are the ones who follow God and obey Him. That's the only meaning it could have at all, if we accept the Bible as evidence, which again we have to question that. So I'm just leaving out the questions about Osama bin Laden and... Uh, <laughs> And some fiqh questions about being a taxi driver and things like that. Inshallah, we'll deal with them another time, inshallah. You know, I always say there's no such thing as a bad question, alhamdulillah. But we want to deal with the ones that are on the topic. If this, inshallah, but if you want to know about Osama bin Laden or what my opinion is and this and that, then we'll deal with that. In fact, we already mentioned a lot about it, alhamdulillah, in a talk, Islam, the Misunderstood Religion, which was given in Sydney uh, 
I, two days ago, something like that, two days ago, Alhamdulillah, I gave the talk in Sydney. We talked about that. And we'll talk about it again uh, in Islam and the current crisis. Inshallah, it should be good. Inshallah. So, there's a question here about Ibrahim's dream uh, telling him to sacrifice his son. And wasn't this only a dream? No, because the dreams, as I mentioned, the dreams of the prophets are true dreams. They are from Allah. They are part of revelation. It is not a dream like our dream. When the prophet sees a dream, then this is something that is from Allah. It is part of revelation. When they see something in a dream, it is part of what Allah has revealed to them. Okay, so it's not merely just some dream like we will have a dream. And please don't think that I see a dream. <laughs> You know, and oh, I saw a dream today, I'm going to have to, you know, uh, blow up my wife or blow up the World Trade Center or something. <laughs> my wife's been giving me a hard time. I saw in a dream that I was chucking her out of the car, you know. <laughs> so, you never know these days, really. Subhanallah. So brothers and sisters, you know, this is for the prophets. Okay, this is only for the prophets. And there is no messengers after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you see a dream like that, better you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Okay, and spit on your left side three times and sleep on the other side. Okay, inshallah. Okay. okay. Just out of curiosity, what's up with the hair, brother? I don't know, man. I, I, I look at the brothers. Why do people have little short, spiky hair, you know? I don't know. They want to look like Marines or something, you know? So, I don't know. Alhamdulillah. You know? So, there's nothing wrong with having long hair, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. The Prophet Sassam used to grow his hair down to his shoulders. Alhamdulillah. And some, uh, he, either, he used to cut it or it used to be sometimes down to his shoulders. So, alhamdulillah, it's part of something, alhamdulillah, allowed. But anyway, the reason, the real, actually, you know, to tell you, I find it a pain to have my hair like this. But the brothers in England, they said, I want you to cut my hair. They said, do not cut your hair, Abdul Rahim. Because when you keep your hair long, you look like Jesus. <laughs> so, and, they say, it's good dower, brother, it's good dower. They look at you and they say, it's Jesus walking. <laughs> I'm, I know you're laughing, I know you're laughing, but wallahi, wallahi, someone came up to me, I shouldn't, we shouldn't say wallahi, it's bad to say that, subhanAllah, just for whatever, but really this happened. A guy came up to me in speaker's corner in England, this is really what he said, he said, if you told me you were the Lord, I'd believe you. <laughs> like, really? And a guy, a guy, this is just the beginning, right? A guy came to me, <clears throat> a guy came to me in the tube. You know, the tube is the underground, right? With the underground. He said, Are you the Lord? <laughs> you Jesus? I said, no, I said, I'm not. But I said, I'm, I'm bringing the same message that he's bringing. Alhamdulillah, gave him some dawah. Alhamdulillah. But the best has to be in Guyana. I went to Guyana, right? You know what, Guyana, it's in part of the Caribbean, it's in South America. And I was, <laughs> the first day, we went to what they call Wakatan, okay? Which means a walk about town. That's great, Wakatan, walk about town. So we were going, <clears throat> we were going on this Wakatan, right? And I was dressed just like I was today, almost exactly. And this woman in the taxi says, Don't keep the Lord all to yourself, bring him over here! <laughs> I was... That was great. I mean, I got a lot of, lot of, uh, but alhamdulillah, anyway, <laughs> that's what's up with the hair, brother. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay.
Yeah, this is mashallah. What what does the star in Judaism resemble? Uh, where did its origin come from? What is its meaning? I, I they call it the Star of David. That's all I know. I don't actually know. That's a, I don't know what its meaning is or where exactly it comes from. But it's called the Star of uh, David. Um, okay. Yeah, and they mentioned about the cross uh, for Christians as a symbol. So what is the meaning of the star? No, Allah, I don't know. Um, oof. Oh dear. Okay, good question here. Did Jesus, Moses and all the prophets uh, pray like the Muslims do? Did they fast like we do? It's a very good question, mashallah. Actually, we don't know for sure exactly. We know definitely that uh, the people before us fasted. And this is what Allah he mentioned in the Quran, that Allah he told us that he, in fasting has been enjoined upon you as it was enjoined upon those who came before you. So yes, the Jews and the Christians, uh, of course, fasting was enjoined upon them. But what was the exact manner of the fast? Was it exactly the same as our fast? Allahu Alam, we don't know. And as for the prayer, was it exactly the same? We can anyway from, if we read uh, some of the scriptures uh, that, you know, from the Jews and the Christians, or especially from the Jews, we will find that there is definitely, we can see common elements. Amongst them is purification, washing oneself uh, before the prayer. Um, definitely it seems to include prostration because we find from uh, the, the scriptural evidence uh, from the statements in the Bible that uh, the prophets including Jesus fell on their face they, it describes them falling on their face which is really prostrating and it also describes them bowing we know that uh, definitely they had regular prayers regular time of prayer but exactly the format was it the same certainly some things were not the same because one of the things that Allah he gave to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the Allah did not give to any other prophet is that the whole world alhamdulillah is a masjid for us subhanallah really we have to think such a great ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such a great blessing from Allah the whole world is a masjid we can actually pray anywhere uh, this was not the case with the people before us. They could only uh, pray, therefore we can understand in specific places. So um, some elements definitely of the prayer uh, remain the same, but some elements definitely are different. Uh, but as I said, purification, prostration, bowing, these things, alhamdulillah, were part of the, um, part of the prayer of the prophets. Alhamdulillah. Mm. This is a good question, but okay, this is an important question now. Is the ram sacrificed by Abraham symbolic of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was the sacrifice for humanity's sins? Jesus' resurrection and miracles are signs of his divinity. It's two very good questions. Let's take the second one first. No. The performing of miracles are not proofs that Jesus is divine. I'm going to give you a very useful tool. A very useful tool. If you want to test the validity of someone's argument, and this doesn't matter whether it's a Muslim talking to you about something in Islam, whether you're discussing about some issue or some principle in Islam, or whether you are discussing with someone who's not a Muslim. So now this the person who wrote this has put forth now an argument, a proposition, okay? Jesus is divine because he did miracles. Therefore, the way to test the validity of an argument is apply the principle universally, meaning apply it to everything, yes? If it works with everything, then it's a good principle. If it doesn't, it's not, it's false. So here's the example. Jesus is God because he performed miracles. Okay, so if Buddha performed miracles, he's also God. If Krishna performed miracles, he's God. If Muhammad performed miracles, you must say he's God. If Abraham or Moses or Elijah performed miracles, you must also say they are God. If it means that someone does miracles and that means they're God, therefore anyone who does miracles is God. Yes? 
that you apply the principle universally. You can't just say, no, no, it's only when Jesus does a miracle, it shows that he's God. When, I, when everyone else does a miracle, it doesn't prove anything. It's not a good argument. It doesn't prove anything that you've got no argument then. Okay? So if Jesus is God because he did miracles, then the other prophets also did miracles. Does that mean you believe they are God? Of course, it doesn't. In fact, again, if we look to the internal evidence in the Bible, Jesus clearly says that I have no power of my own. I have no power of my own. The power that I have is from God. So Jesus is clearly showing that what he does is not from himself. This is from God as every other prophet. When he does a miracle, it is from God. Okay. Now the ram sacrificed by Abraham is symbolic of Jesus, the Lamb of God. MashaAllah. Yes. Sacrificed by Abraham is si <laughs> Who is the sacrifice? Okay. Now this is No, it, it's not symbolic at all. First of all, we have to understand that a sacrifice, a sacrifice in this case, okay, is when you sacrifice something that belongs to you, and this sacrifice is an illustration of your obedience to God. If I take a lamb, or I take a sheep, or something, or a cow, whatever, and I sacrifice it, this is the money that I spend, or this is the effort that I expend, And therefore, I sacrifice something from myself. I sacrifice something from myself. And when some Christians talk, as they do, they say, well, in Judaism there is sacrifice. And atonement for sins. In order to atone for sins, you must commit a sacrifice. In fact, the belief of Judaism is exactly the same as the Islamic belief. In Islam, there are certain sins that you commit, and in order to repent from those sins and for your repentance to be correct, you have to make kafara, you have to make expiation. For example, if you kill an animal, uh, if you hunt an animal in, during ihram, during hajj, yeah, then you as a compensation have to sacrifice some animal that is equivalent to compensate for it. Or for example, you miss out one of the rites of Hajj, then you have to sacrifice a lamb as compensation. Or for example, uh, if you kill someone accidentally, you have to fast uh, for a year or uh, whatever the different, sacri the different compensations are. So this is kafar. So for certain sins that you commit, part of the correct tawbah and repentance is to do these particular acts. It's the same in Judaism. The Jews, for certain sins, there were certain sacrifices that they had to do. But the purpose behind that is, of course, that you sacrifice something for yourself. How can you equate that, therefore, with God sacrificing somebody else or another person in order for you to forgive your sins? Where is the sacrifice in that? Where is your sacrifice in that? No, this is someone else being killed. There is no sacrifice from you. You are not doing anything. Someone else is being sacrificed. So the concept, in fact, is a totally different concept altogether. They are not similar at all. So, the ram sacrificed by Abraham is not symbolic of Jesus at all. Not at all. In fact, this ram sacrificed is merely, uh, as we in Islam, we know that something is sacrificed. Uh, as we know, if we commit a sin or we do something or so on, or this is an act of obedience to God. Because, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, it is not the flesh and the blood that reaches Allah, but it is your piety. It's your piety that reaches Allah. It is the fact that you are doing something because Allah has ordered it. That is what is the wisdom behind it. Allah has ordered you to do something, and therefore the piety is in your act of obedience to God. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, that's the most of the questions on the topic. Now, do we want to deal with some other questions as well? Abu Hamza? No? No? Okay, inshallah. So, Jazakallah uh, khair, brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all close to the truth. May Allah help us to act upon the knowledge uh, that we have learned. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfirullah.